now you're seeing the co-grand marshal, Ben Nighthorse Campbell, the only Native American Indian serving in the United States House of Representatives. You notice that some Indian people back. used to think if you go the white path, you lose your Indianness about you. And other people think if you just stay in with the blanket, as they say, just with the Indian lifestyle, you can't ever survive in the outside community. I just don't think that's true. I think you can do both. And I think more and more Indian people are believing like I do now that you can, we say, walk both paths or live in both worlds. You can do it. And that's what I continually encourage Indian kids to do. Learn the way that's going to make you survive, that's going to provide food for your youngsters when you grow up. But don't forget the old ways or forget the sacrifices that your ancestors made so that you could still be here on this land. Senator Ben Nighthorse Campbell has proven those points by his own example. As a Cheyenne Indian and a U.S. Senator from Colorado, his hard work and determination exemplify the Cheyenne tradition of strength and survival. And his successes have demonstrated to the world that Indians are indeed still here and ready to be heard. The Cheyenne call themselves Tsistis, which means the people. The Cheyennes are one of many Native American tribes who speak a language from the Algonquin language family. For centuries, these groups occupied a large expanse of North America, and based on their shared language, we can draw some conclusions about their history. The Cheyenne were agricultural villagers living in the area of the Great Lakes, and as late as 1750 or so, they were living farming, sedentary, permanent way of life. They ended up moving permanently onto the plains so that by 1780 or 1790, they were roaming throughout the northern and central plains, hunting buffalo, living in nomadic camps, pursuing a very different way of life than they had pursued just uh, 20, 30 years before. Despite changes in their location and lifestyles, one thing remained constant for the Cheyenne, their spirituality. They felt a deep relationship with the natural world and believed that it must be replenished on a regular basis through prayers and rituals. The sweat lodge served as a sanctuary for prayer, healing, and various ceremonies. A typical sweat lodge consisted of a round framework of branches covered with animal hides. Today, the sweat lodge is still an integral part of Cheyenne life. Except now, the animal hides are usually replaced by tarps, blankets, quilts, and any other usable materials that are available. A fire is built to heat up the rocks. The hot rocks are placed in the center of the sweat lodge. Water is then poured over these rocks to generate steam, very much the way a sauna works. As the steam and temperature rises, the participants sweat cleansing their bodies of both physical and spiritual impurities as they sing and pray. Perhaps the most important Cheyenne ceremony is the sun dance that celebrates the beginning of the Cheyenne New Year. During the four days of fasting and dancing, the people pray for the welfare of the world, their tribe, and those among them who need special help. The Cheyennes kept a sense of continuity by repeating time-honored religious rites, but gradually, life on the plains introduced major changes in their society. The Cheyennes considered themselves to be members of their mother's band, and that tended to be the band in which they lived most of their life. Once they got onto the plains, though, that matrilineal rule was relaxed, because one of the, one of the things about a nomadic existence is you need to have flexibility. You need to have the ability to move from one band to another if conditions change. And, and a matrilineal way of life is much too rigid for that kind of flexibility. One of the reasons flexibility was needed was that many Indian groups were suddenly competing for the same resources. The Cheyenne were moving onto the plains at a time when other peoples were as well, the Arapaho, the Sioux. Um, they came into conflict with those peoples as well as with the Pawnees who had lived on the Central Plains for thousands of years. They came on and immediately began to compete for access to bison and especially for control of trade. Trade became crucial for American Indians in the 1700s because for many tribes it was the only way to get horses. Horses had been brought to the New World by Spanish colonists in Mexico and gradually spread across the continent. 
The Cheyenne soon became very skilled at breeding, riding, and trading horses. This greatly increased their ability to hunt, travel, and conduct warfare when necessary. Warfare was carried out by one or more of the Cheyenne's five military societies. Of these, the most notable were the dog soldiers, who were among the most feared warriors in the region. Despite their power, the military societies always worked in concert with the chiefs and the Central Tribal Council. The Cheyenne had a Central Tribal Council called the Council of 44. And this was made up of the leaders of each of the Cheyenne bands. Uh, these tended to be older leaders who had already been warriors and now were spending most of their time engaged in trade activity. The Council of 44 was then balanced, sort of like one branch of government balanced with another, by the Cheyenne military societies, which were made up of younger warriors, men who were still proving their reputations for leadership. If they were going to go to warfare, if they were going to make a, a big move, both had to agree. One could not act without the other. So it's a very nice balance of power that way. This governing structure helped to ensure tribal unity and coordinate the actions of numerous bands across the wide area. In this way, the Cheyennes came to dominate much of the Central Plains. But while the Cheyennes started to expand across the West, so did the young nation on the continent's eastern seaboard. After the Louisiana Purchase in 1804, the United States laid claim to the land that the Cheyennes and numerous other native peoples inhabited. White settlers, or Anglos, began filtering westward. Some wanted farmland and a place to raise a family. Others sought hunting and trapping grounds for beavers and other fur-bearing animals. And still others came west in search of gold and silver. The Cheyenne ranged, once they got onto the plains, from Wyoming and Montana down into Texas and Oklahoma. That meant that when Kansas, Nebraska, and Colorado were settled, either for agricultural purposes or for mining purposes, that sort of drove a wedge into the center of the Cheyenne Range. And it had led to the sort of uh, division of the Cheyenne into the northern and southern Cheyenne. The U.S. government recognized that it would need the Indians' cooperation to continue settling the plains. In 1851, it organized one of the most spectacular meetings of American history. Over 10,000 Indians, representing over a dozen tribes, gathered near Fort Laramie in what is now Wyoming. They made peace not only with each other, but also with United States agents, and signed the Treaty of Fort Laramie. The Indians could not have foreseen the result, that hordes of white Americans were about to pour across the Mississippi and into their lives. Native Americans saw the land as something sacred, to be shared and preserved by all, not something that could be owned by individuals. But the newcomers seemed to see things differently. They put up fences and built armed forts across the plains. Worst of all, they began destroying the buffalo herds on which the Cheyennes depended. Well, I think all Indian people, the Mother Earth that they feel a part of, particularly where their ancestors lie, the remains of their ancestors, it, it, it takes on a different connotation than just ownership in the white sense of the word where I own a certain tract of land and it's bounded by certain fences or certain geographic dimensions. It's totally different for Indians because they feel a spiritual kindredness to it. Uh, to, to not to be on that land to them is like taking away part of their church. Although most Cheyennes remained peaceful, other tribes did not. Tensions grew to the breaking point, and a delegation of Indians went to Washington to seek peace. Representing the Cheyennes were Chiefs Lean Bear, War Bonnet, and Standing in the Water. They met with President Abraham Lincoln and came away feeling they had been heard fairly. Out west, however, anti-Indian hysteria was unabated. Soldiers, seeking a band of violent Arapahoes, stumbled instead upon a Cheyenne hunting party. It was led by Lean Bear, still wearing the peace medallion given him by President Lincoln. As Lean Bear saw the soldiers and rode up to them, they shot him dead. Furious, the Cheyennes retaliated. The dog soldiers were led by Bull Bear, Lean Bear's brother, and they were particularly fierce in their attacks on wagon trains and settlements. Finally, the U.S. Army attempted to reach agreement with the Cheyennes. 
Major Edward Wincoop met with Chief Black Kettle, and the two men formed a mutual trust. Many lodges of Arapahoes were camped near Fort Lyon, where they expected to receive food and protection from the Army. Black Kettle's band made plans to join them, but had to wait due to lack of food at the fort. Meanwhile, Colorado Territorial Governor John Evans sought votes by rousing anti-Indian sentiment. He established a new regiment of Indian fighters, and Colonel John M. Shivington, also running for office, led the regiment off in search of a fight in order to justify its existence. Near dawn, Shivington encountered Black Kettle's band camp near a bend in the Sand Creek. His well-armed men attacked the sleeping camp, butchering women and children and taking scalps. By afternoon, they had killed some 500 innocent people. The Cheyennes sought revenge in frequent attacks that did not end until the Medicine Lodge Treaty of 1867. While most professional soldiers, surprisingly, on the plains, were more interested in peaceable solutions, Custer, uh, perhaps most notably in Oklahoma, raided a mixed village of Cheyennes, Comanches, and Kiowas in the Battle of the Washita in which he and his soldiers basically overran a sleeping village uh, just at dawn and murdered mostly women and children. He was in the Indian war business in order to make a name for himself. By now, many Southern Cheyennes were living alongside Arapaho Indians on a reservation in Oklahoma. The federal agent there was Britton Darlington, an elderly but industrious Quaker. He secured additional land from the government and built many improvements for the Indians' benefit. Men like Darlington believed in the possibility of peace between Indians and non-Indians. But others, like U.S. Army General Philip Sheridan, could be satisfied only by defeating Indians with military means. In 1874, Indians grew desperate and increased their attacks on white hunters, surveying teams, and wagon trains last-ditch attempt to preserve their way of life. But Sheridan used this as an excuse for punitive expeditions against every native tribe in the area. He systematically destroyed the camps of all Southern Cheyennes not living on the Darlington Agency. He then singled out 31 men, including Chief Minime and one woman, put them in irons and sent them to Fort Marion Prison in Florida. While the Southern Cheyennes were slowly losing out to people settling on their land, the Northern Cheyenne's biggest problem at first was people coming through their land. The Cheyenne area that they were making use of in the Northern Plains was not directly in the Gold Rush area, but it was an area that miners came through to get to, the, to where they were looking for silver and gold. Cheyennes, led by Chiefs Little Wolf and Dull Knife, made alliances with Sioux bands under Chief Red Cloud. Together, they laid siege to Fort Phil Kearney. Like most Army officers, Lieutenant W.J. Fetterman was not used to Indian-style warfare. Fetterman let himself be drawn into an ambush and was killed, along with 81 soldiers. For the moment, at least, such victories helped the Indians to make their point. The government abandoned its forts along the trail and established two reservations in South Dakota, where some Cheyennes agreed to settle. Most, however, remained on the open land. When gold was discovered in the Black Hills region in South Dakota, Indians refused to sell the land. White greed overcame common decency, and the U.S. War Department invented various reasons to send the army after the Cheyennes. Three different units pursued the Cheyennes to the area of the Little Bighorn River in June of 1876. One was led by General George Armstrong Custer. This time, Custer's lust for glory would cost him dearly. He rushed to attack a force of Indians without knowing its true size. By day's end, Custer and at least 250 soldiers and officers lay dead. The Indians knew that their great victory at the Little Bighorn would bring down the wrath of the white government. The northern Cheyennes hid out with the Sioux and remained in the countryside for as long as possible. But with few horses and little food, they spent the winter near starvation. Finally, most of the northern Cheyennes surrendered at Fort Robinson in Nebraska. 
they were now at the mercy of a government that seemed to know only cruelty. In the blazing summer of 1877, a thousand Cheyennes were forced to walk for 70 days to reach Oklahoma. The journey killed or sickened many of them, and the conditions at their destination did not relieve their misery. The next year, Little Wolf, Dull Knife, and other chiefs left the reservation and led a small band back toward the North Country. Their escape was discovered, but the Cheyennes managed to hold off the 4th Cavalry and press onward. Eventually, both groups surrendered to U.S. forces. Dull Knife's group was imprisoned at the Red Cloud Agency near Fort Robinson. Conditions were harsh and inhumane. Once again, they tried to escape and failed. Finally, Little Wolf, along with a few hundred of his band, were sent to the Pine Ridge Agency and then assigned to their own agency in Montana. Their heroic journey and perseverance had finally earned the Northern Cheyenne a little piece of their homeland. Once the Cheyenne people were on a reservation, the federal government decided that it was too expensive to run a reservation and that the best thing to do would be to make Indian people like any other people in the United States. That means that they had to find some way to make them stop speaking their language, stop participating in their traditional religious ceremonies, uh, and get them into the Anglo economy. The federal government then began the Indian boarding school experiment in which Indian children were in many cases forcibly removed from their families, shipped miles and miles away from those families, often off the reservation, uh, placed in situations where they were not allowed to speak their traditional language, where they were forced to speak English, and taught trades. Some government officials felt that they were acting in the Indians' best interest. But the policy of assimilation did more harm than good. To be assimilated into mainstream culture, Indians would have to own land as individuals the way Anglos did. Thus, the U.S. passed the General Allotment Act in 1887, prohibiting Indians from owning land as a group. Instead, the new law allotted 160-acre tracts of land to individual Indians. These tracts were often some distance apart, which made it even harder for the Cheyennes to maintain their tribal identity. It was not by coincidence that allotment also resulted in a net reduction of the total land owned by Indians. After giving out individual allotments, the government took the remainder and gave it to non-Indian settlers. Under strong pressure from Washington, the Southern Cheyennes accepted their allotments in 1892. The Northern Cheyennes resisted allotment for another 40 years and through their diligence have managed to retain tribal ownership of 98% of their land. Lame Deer, Montana the center of tribal government, as well as the most populated area in the Northern Cheyenne Reservation. Every year on July 4th weekend, Lame Deer plays host to their annual intertribal powwow. Native Americans from many tribes travel across the country to be a part of this joyous event. Here they set up camp for several days, some in traditional teepees, and share stories, songs, and prayers. In the 1800s, there were the, the government mandated certain rules of what Indians could do and couldn't do, and they prevented them by law and at gunpoint of doing any of their religious and cultural dances. Well, they've gone back to doing some of the old dances now, the sun dances, they're doing those again. But these dances are kind of became intertribal uh, friendship kind of dances. But if you look at the outfits, there's different styles. You can see the Northern Plains traditional dancers, and the Southern Plains traditional dancers, and Northern Plains fancy dancers, shawl dancers, buckskin dancers, jingle dress dancers. And it takes a practiced eye to spot all that, as well as to judge if they're any good or not. <laughs> Native American groups forget their differences not only to enjoy intertribal powwows, but also to achieve common political goals. A good example was the passage of legislation that changed the name of the National Monument, 
where the Indians defeated General Custer. It was the only battlefield in America that was named after a person rather than a place. All Civil War battlefields give equal stature to both sides of the conflict because they were warriors. Winning and losing was secondary to the fact that they both should have status in the eyes of American history and we should be proud that they were Americans doing what they thought was the right thing at the time. Whether it was a right or wrong doesn't make a difference. They thought they were and they gave their lives for it. We think Indians should have that right too. Many of them gave their lives at that battlefield because they believed that was their land and they were defending it. To name it after the other side, particularly when the other side lost, was wrong. Just wrong to do that. It's not man, a white man versus Indian anymore. We are able to, we are embracing the white people into our cultures, but it took time. It didn't take, didn't take overnight. It's gone through generations, and it's been a while now. So that's why, when an Indian, I mean, a white person comes up, we're able to talk to them. Okay, to my right, there's a sign there that was specially made for this purpose. Name in the building, Ben Nighthorse Campbell Complex. During the groundbreaking ceremony for their new tribal complex, they honored their brother, Senator Campbell, as a testament to his fight for the rights of all Native Americans. I think the best thing I can do in the U.S. Senate is to provide a conduit between the Indian community and other senators. I've never ever said that I can fix all the problems all by myself. I can't do that. I don't have a magic wand. But also, uh, the second thing that I think that I can do for them is to help them appreciate the fact that social change never comes easy in America. The fight for equality, the struggle for economic stability, and the preservation of their culture will be passed on to their children. And so, great efforts are taken to encourage their young people to be committed to the future of their tribe and their reservation. I think it is important to keep the language going because it's dying out. I mean, there's only the elders that know it and some of the older people, so we need to learn the language and keep the traditions going. Language is important because, um, you know, you have, you're a Native American and you have your own culture and tradition and so, you know, learning your language and, you know, their beliefs is something that you should be proud, you know, and you should know. And so, you know, I think being Native American, you should at least try and know your language. If we don't keep our traditions alive, our cultures will dry out and we will become non-existent. I guess the way I look at the youth is uh, they're going to preserve this whole tribe. It's up to them to guard and protect the tribe. And I guess their biggest weapon is education. And, uh, and they have to get that edu education, but they can't lose touch with their culture doing it. And it's a hard thing to do because there's a lot of things that are there to destroy that alcohol and drugs. So there's a lot of pitfalls that we have to uh, help our youth around. And when they're in them, we have to help them out of them. For some young people, there will always be the lure of the outside world. Little Denise Littleson was 10 years old when she chose to leave the reservation like to attend a non-Indian school. Because um, I think it was just the curiosity of what the white man was like. Are their homes like ours? Is, are their streets like ours? Do they dress the way we do? You know, what, what is it that makes them um, better than us was, was my idea. Uh, my mom really discouraged it because she went through some um, she went to a BIA school, and so she went through some real, you know, harsh prejudices from the white man, and, and she really didn't want me to go through that. When I first got there, they um, put me with the Hispanics, and I told them, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a Hispanic, I'm an Indian. And when the word got around that I was an Indian, it was really strange how kids would come up to me and, and they, you know, would touch my arm, and I'd look at them and, you know, what are you doing? Or I'd, I wouldn't say it, I'd just move away from them. And a couple of days went by where, you know, they would just, people were just looking at me and I didn't know why they were doing that. And I'd look at myself and say, is there something wrong? Am I dressing weird or am I just, am I not dressed right? Or, and I'd look at them and I'd think, well, you know, I'm, I got the same kinds of clothes on they do, or um, I'm wearing blue jeans and they are, what's different about me? 
And um, I, it took me about probably the first two or three weeks of school to realize, hey, it's because I'm an Indian and I'm, I'm different than, than, from them and they don't know, you know what to expect from me. Denise Little's son's experience inspired her to become active in sharing her culture with others, a family tradition that started with her great-great-grandmother, Ethel Ridge Walker. When this photograph was taken, she was being interviewed about the Battle of Little Bighorn because she was born two days after the battle. Denise's great-grandfather, John Stanzentimper, whose father fought in the Battle of Little Bighorn, co-authored Cheyenne Memories, a book about northern Cheyenne history and culture. Her grandmother, Josephine Stanson Timber Glenmore, was active in the preservation of the Cheyenne language. This is a copy of the book that my grandmother wrote with Wayne Lehman. It's the Cheyenne Topical Dictionary. And this is her way of preserving the language and the culture. My family has been somewhat real instrumental in, in teaching generation after generation the importance of our culture and our language and that we are a people of great heritage and culture but we need to realize that even though we are different and somewhat we are all the same and that our culture is a very proud culture and that we want our children and and other children to know that we are alike in many ways, even though we are a tribe of Cheyenne people.